Spanish and Portuguese division himself. Hiding away in the back of the room is one of their most uh, interesting and beloved professors. That's David Foster pretending that he's not here. And um, Daniel Holcomb is somebody, uh, for me particularly, it is a real pleasure to introduce him because he has been one of our um, finest collaborators. He has written articles for us. He has participated beautifully in all of our conferences. I encourage you all to come to our wonderful February conference, or I sure as hell hope Daniel will give another <laughs> submission. Um, and Danielle is now on the work market, I believe. Right? Mm -hmm. And yes. so what you're going to see is possibly something that all the wonderful people who interview you uh, might get a little bit of a chance to see. Just very quickly, our, our ad hoc lectures serve a double purpose. One is to help final stage PhDs. That sounds hideous, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Final stage That's what PhDs. it feels like by that point. Okay, let me rephrase that. <laughs> One is to help PhDs who are on the verge of finishing uh, the degree and out in the work market to get a chance to actually expound what they have and to hear your Criticism, suggestions, and praise. Um, and one is also simply for uh, people who are connected with our center to have the possibility to open up their research to other people. So these are small, intimate affairs with candy and fake spiders, as you see. And um, Danielle is doing a very, very interesting combination of early modern studies, meaning, of course, the time period I focus on, which is late 15th through the end of the 18th century, with gender studies, cultural studies, and I'm going to shut up because he's much more interested. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much, Sharona. I'd like to thank Dr. Robert Bork and uh, Dr. Sharona Frederick for the for encouraging the graduate students to uh, present in this kind of venue. Uh, it's very much appreciated. Also, Kendra and Angela, thank you so much for your your support. I'd like to preface this presentation with. Uh, sort of a contextualization. My history in queer theory has been primarily regarding Latin American cultural production. Uh, I have now begun to apply queer theory towards an analyses of early modern texts, including Don Quixote. So I thought, well, wouldn't it be fun to explore what are some of the uh, issues surrounding such a, such a statement or such an approximation? So I would like you to think about what you consider it, uh, maybe a challenge, or even if there are any challenges, you may you may not think that there are any challenges. That we're free to apply whatever theory we want to. Uh, of course, certainly some people you know believe that there is a temporal uh, uh, barrier between present day and early modern texts, and we can simply not take them from behind the glass in the museum to examine them using current day uh, terminology. But having said that, I would like this to be con uh, conversational, and once I finish, I would like to be able to open up uh, for questions and answers, and also your thoughts, because like I said, this represents a turning point in the trajectory of my analyses, which is now moving towards early modern and peninsular, uh, Hispanic peninsular uh, studies. In Don Quixote de la Mancha, uh, Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra's most famous protagonist is an older man in his 50s and, as Daniel Eisenberg maintains, is likely still a virgin. He constructs and upholds the idealized image of woman, yet avoids actually pursuing her. In his various adventures, he avoids contact with Aldonza, sending instead his male squire, Sancho Panza. He never meets Aldonza. Instead, he relies on Sancho's ekphrastic narrative skills to learn of her appearance and personality. In fact, Don Quixote avoids sexual pairings with women throughout his adventures. He instead develops a long-lasting male homosocial love for Sancho Panza, a deep and profound relationship Eisenberg calls unparalleled in literature. Quote, it is no distortion to call it love, and their bound grows to be as permanent as marriage itself. Such a lifelong, intense male friendship, which Cervantes was never to achieve in his life, is the greatest emotional satisfaction one can achieve in this world. Daniel, do, you, do you want me to show the slide? Whatever you, I don't know if you guys can see it or not. Yeah, now I can see it. Actually, no, I, leave that, leave it off. I can read. You sure? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. great. 
So what do these observations, as framed by present-day terminology and social models, reveal about Don Quixote? Do they identify him as one of the most famous proto-gay protagonists in history? Or is he simply a sexually ambiguous figure too wrapped up in the fantasy of chivalry to which to actively pursue sexual relationships? Does Don Quixote realize that Dulcinea is unattainable and therefore simply too far up the proverbial pedestal as an idealized woman for him to ever physically pair with her? Are any of these questions answerable given the 400 years that separate current readers from early 17th century Spain? Does the application of present-day concepts and theories to re-readings of Don Quixote, even though much of the terminology did not exist in the time period uh, in which the novel was written, does it really problematize Cervantine, Cervantine uh, scholarship? And finally, can we successfully query him? <coughs> These are intriguing questions that inspire scholars and readers to revisit the text and existing criticism in search of possible answers. Some present-day scholars successfully apply their respective special specializations towards readings of the text by revealing instances in the narrative that permit parenthetical analyses afforded by specific thematic and theoretical approximations. Some of these inspire further in-depth in analyses that invite the reader to explore the novel for, for clarity, examples, or even contradiction. The same may be said when engaging in a queer reading. For example, as Eisenberg notes, after contextualizing the protagonist within 17th century Spanish culture, it becomes clear that Cervantes' narrative renders Don Quixote as a protagonist who is aversive to procreation. When contemplating Eisenberg's findings, one is therefore inspired to search for evidence in the text to uphold or dismiss his observations. As a result, some scholars are intrigued by the notion that Don Quixote avoids sexual pairing in general, and as contextualized both contemporaneously and from the present day, this behavior presents two sexually framed social reference. First, some Cervantes experts, such as Carol B. Johnson, who, focuses, who focus on exploring psychoanalytical readings of the text, consider such behavior as indicative of celibacy, chastity, or even impotence. Don Quixote's aversion to contemporary patriarchal nation-building social norms in Renaissance Spain are queer, in the sense that his adventures are different from contemporary socio-political concepts, thereby impeding uh, social and intimate situations in which children are the biological result. What we, we, what we would today call Don Quixote's family construct within the temporal and diegetic trajectory of the novel consists of two people, Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. Therefore, Eisenberg concludes that celibacy and emotionality displayed by Don Quixote are considered social otherness and are, quote, only for the special view. Second, one may also argue that Don Quixote's adulation of Dulcinea as ideal woman suggests the aspiration to become that which he so adamantly seeks. Through this line of thinking, one may ask whether Don Quixote was what we call today homosexual. <coughs> one may venture even further and postulate that perhaps Don Quixote's adulation of the perfect woman was really a reflection of his own internalized impossible dream to become Dulcinea. Finally, one could consider the relationship that Don Quixote formulates with Sancho as viably homoaffective, even taking into consider even after taking into consideration the role that fantasy and reality hold in the novel. Yet is there evidence within the text to support these postulations? While representing valid approximations for some, they can cause other scholars to cringe and dismiss them as simply applying present-day concepts, terminology, and themes to a 400-year-old text, protagonist, and society. This presentation, therefore, explores reading Don Quixote from a queer perspective, queer theory perspective, that contextualizes academic polemics by first examining temporal and thematic barriers that guide, encourage, and challenge a queer reading of any can canonical text from the early modern period. Second, criticism will be reviewed that presents methodologies and concepts that apply queer and other sexuality studies to Don Quixote. 
The querying of Renaissance and Baroque figures is by no means a new development. Historical queer theorists Jonathan Goldberg and Madhavi Menon recall the 2004 MLA convention panel that reflected on 10 years of queer theoretical development since the 1994 publication of Goldberg's Queering the Renaissance. Erudite scholars from that volume, such as Alan Gray, Marcy Frank, Graham Hamill, Richard Rambus, and Valerie Trobe, had, ma had made major strides in the previous 10 years by applying various queer theorizations to historical texts. At the same time, in the art world, the parallel phenomenon uh, of the polemical application of present-day theory on art history analyses had already been addressed by Norman Bryson in 1983, in which the author noted increasing distancing between art and the rest of the humanities. Bryson's question resulted in the application of various theories uh, to art analyses, thereby opening up, quote, a variety of different perspectives on theoretical topics that are crucial to historical interpretation, end quote. In essence, within art history as a discipline, there is no longer a single theoretical or methodological paradigm that guides and limits art history analyses. The same can be said of queer theory. Goldberg and Madhavi underscore that one should never, never presume if and how discourses of sexuality will intersect historically with any given text, thereby questioning what effect a temporal barrier has on present day literary analyses. For example, they signal, signal that themes of difference and heteronormalization as two key factors. Quote, why has it come to pass that we apprehend the past in the mode of difference? How has history come to equal alterity? And what effect does the privileging of the hetero have on studies of sexuality? End quote. Menon explains in her later text, Shakespeare, that there are three framing reference that define the application of queer theory to early modern studies, language, identity, and temporality. She concludes that the queering of Renaissance icons such as, such as Shakespeare is indeed possible, but only after re-theorizing the nuances of queer theory to facilitate a two-way reciprocal relationship. Quote, queer theory has set up two strong institutional boundaries of its own accepting as its proper domain a historical period in which queerness comes to be understood as homosexuality. The convergence of these two boundaries, the one temporal and the other identitarian, ensures that a queered Shakespeare is never a queer Shakespeare. Let me repeat that. That a queered Shakespeare is never a queer Shakespeare. Instead, it allows us to fix the place of Shakespeare and queer theory, both in themselves and in re relation to each other, and gives us able-bodied monoliths instead of libertines with the queer shakes." End quote. Therefore, queer theory scholars take great care when applying present-day theories of vocabulary to cultural production produced in the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and the Enlightenment societies, including such canonical authors such as Shakespeare and Cervantes, among others. One may not utilize such present-day terminology loosely, when analyzing the sexual characterization of a protagonist so far removed temporarily from present day concepts. Yet one can apply queer theory and that which Madhavi explains as temporal and identitarian to Cervantes and Don, Don Quixote, thereby creating a queer Quixote and not necessarily a queer Quixote. Precisely because of these anachronistic and temporal factors, some scholars argue that one may not call Don, Don Quixote homosexual bisexual, asexual, or even heterosexual, because those terms did not exist in his time period. This is because present-day binary concepts of sexuality were defined in the 19th century when homosexuality was diagnosed as a medical condition. At that point, heterosexuality as a concept was invented as its otherness, or vice versa, the proverbial other side of the coin. Without homosexuality, heterosexuality as a concept could not exist. If, then, we cannot label Don Quixote as heterosexual, what does that mean for current heteronormative criticism? Conversely, gay essentialism also exists through homonormativity by only seeking historic or uh, literary homosexual figures without considering heteronormative or homonormative factors as two sides of the same coin. 
Therefore, to successfully queer Don Quixote, one must also take into, take, uh, into consideration the revealing and contextualizing passages from the text that present contemporary themes that may be interpreted as sexually determinate as defined by today's concept, concepts of sexuality. This presentation will therefore also address the absence of sexuality as a possible negation of the patriarchal mandate to procreate for crown and country, uh, while analyzing the contemporaneous male-male bonding with Sancho Panza that we would today call homosocial, homoaffective, or even homoerotic. The relationship will be compared with the social construct of amicitia, or the perfect male friendship. Finally, it will explore a lesbian facet by reviewing criticism that considers the Aldonza Dulcinea binary as lesbian. While such themes may be conveniently explained away based on the fact that Don Quixote goes mad after reading chivalry books and subsequently that his quests reside squarely within his own fantasy, one may not continue to ignore the temporality of signs and reference that place Don Quixote, the novel, squarely within the theoretical framework of queer studies. In the case of Shakespeare, Menon explains that such signs and reference direct the reader to perceive the author as, quote, a queer theorist, not because he has written essays with the word queer in the title, but because his work already inhabits a queer theory we occupy today, end quote. Queer theory, therefore, effectively reveals and investigates all sexual and gender modalities as expressed in any given society and in any given epoch by examining what has already been expressed in its cultural production. For example, by comparing the relationship between Don Quixote and Sancho, present-day themes such as the association of able-bodiedness and heterosexuality allow scholars to examine how protagonist Don Quixote has an older, perhaps arthritic, and quite mad gentleman is not able, fully able-bodied or able-minded, and therefore not what we would call a representative of, of the patriarchal norm of his time. In part one, chapter four of the novel, the protagonist feels compelled to defend Lucinea's own able-bodiedness to the mule driver, who, upon hearing her description, contemplates her beauty. Quote, even if her portrait shows us that she is blind in one eye and that blood and brimstone flow from the other, despite all that, to please her grace, we will praise her in everything you might wish. Nothing flows from her, vile rabble, replied Don Quixote, burning with rage. Nothing flows from her, I say, but amber and delicate musk, and she is not blind or humpbacked, but is upright as the peak of the Guadaramas. But you will pay for how you have blasphemed against beauty as extraordinary as that of my lady." End quote. Therefore, beauty also equals able-bodiedness, as Don Quixote adds to the narrative that she is not humpbacked. Later in the same chapter, the mule driver beats up Don Quixote, and after the attack, the protagonist clarifies his own physical limitations due to age or disease or both. Quote, and he, when he found himself alone, tried again to see if he could stand. But if he could not when he was hale and healthy, how could he when he was beaten up almost to a pulp? End quote. Queer theorist Robert McRuer, I'm just making sure he's on advancing as, as I want to. Uh, queer theorist Robert McGrewer explains that compulsory, compulsory heterosexuality demands able-bodiedness, without uh, which social agency is impossible. While a, hom a homo-affective male-male relationship may historically be considered a fad within the sexual explorations of a youth, or may be explained uh, within the defining historical definitions of sodomy between older men and younger boys in the Renaissance, Don Quixote, as an older man, begins his same-sex, homosocial, and homoaffective relationship with an older man, Sancho Panza, later in life. So there is no social agent that allows this not to be brushed under the, car under the carpet, short of adopting an ageist perspective that socially diagnoses him as insane and physically limited, thereby converting him into a comedic and laughable failure. Even if this burlesque characterization in the end resulted from an attempt by Cervantes to avert the Inquisition in a literary blurring of social scripts and cover-ups, 
the sociosexual reference, such as able-bodiedness, just demonstrate how Cervantes' text inhabits today's queer theory concepts, thereby creating Menon's reciprocity required for two-way queer analyses. Conversely, post-queer theorists such as James Penny maintain that queer theory seems at times to follow the heteronormative binary model by focusing on the aesthetics of marginality and otherness dictated by such a model. While queer theory's goal is to reveal such binaries, excuse me, the threat of reductionism enters into queer studies precisely because some queer theorizations focus on a singular and paradigmatic revelation of some type of otherness. <coughs> However, the identification of otherness in cultural production is a valuable humanities center's perspective that at times identifies visible and identifiable occurrences and representations of heteronormativity or even homonormativity. Indeed, as David William Foster maintains, just as with feminisms um, that exist as a grouping of feminist theorizations within feminist theory in general, queer theorizations exist as a plural within queer theory so that no singular dominating paradigm may assert itself as a normalizing hegemonic concept. On the contrary, queer readings often reveal enigmas and mysteries that inspire further research in order to reveal normative clues as to what is happening in any given text. Before specifically queering Don Quixote, the historical concept of a queer Iberian peninsula must first be addressed. From its earliest history, its, its physical location or the physical location of the peninsula has been considered European geographic and thematic otherness. Gregory Hutchin and Josiah Blackmore maintained that, quote, ever since the Romans named Iberia's western reaches Extremadura, the extreme territories, it has lain on the margins of Europe's consciousness, always the site of difference, always queer Iberia. Within the Europe of the Chanson de Roland, Iberia was the land of the Saracens a dark-skinned people who represented to the rest of Europe the dangerous sexual and gender temptation represented by African cultures." End quote. Therefore, Hutchison and Blackmore identify the central core issue axial to the Iberian Peninsula's long history of defining itself against the otherness of other cultures. The clash between Christian heteronormativity and the sexual otherness represented by all of the other cultures inhabiting the peninsula. Throughout the Middle Ages, themes such as sodomy and unnatural sexualities were vehemently opposed as revealed in God's divine plan. The Saracens were perceived as a people whose sexuality, quote, exceeds the bounds of a Christian normativity, thereby signaling the shadow side of European culture, Muslim Iberia, and sexual excess, end quote. Such a sexual otherness propagates what Edward Said maintains in Orientalism in 1978, that Europe has historically defined itself against the otherness of the Middle East. Therefore, the otherness represented by the Orient comprises the other side of the coin that concomitantly defines Western Europe. It is therefore important to underscore that the sexual otherness feared by Northern Spanish Christians also represents a surrogate and underground self against which early modern Spanish heteronormativity defines itself. The fact that it is within human nature to become the otherness is the reason it is so vehemently feared and prosecuted. Persecuted, sorry. Additionally, the image of Spain held by the rest of Europe has consistently been, been considered feminine throughout the centuries, precisely due to interactions with African cultures and their propensity for what today we call homosexuality. Mel Allen Penrose explains that the theme of masculinity in Spain during the 18th and 19th centuries is quite understudied. The author thematically examines heteronormalization as represented in Spanish Enlightenment literature, revealing not only the masculine, feminine, European, African binaries, but also the critical factor of queer visibility that defines how the rest of Europe has traditionally perceived Spain. Therefore, it is essential to underscore that queer theory explores not only that which is disguised or blurred due to censorship or fear of persecution, but also focuses on figures who have, whose high visibility makes them impossible to ignore. Effeminate men, for example, have historically maintained a high visibility in any given society, whatever label has been assigned to them. 
Yet at the same time within Spain, nation building and the concept of a patriarchal model that ensures the well-being of the nation state reacts in opposition to such queer visibility. Hutchison and Blackmore emphasized the long tradition of heteronormative nationalism in the peninsula, underscoring a heterosexual privilege, thereby challenging queer studies that examine both present-day cultural production and cultures, as well as texts far removed in time. This presentation's uh, approximation to the theme of queering Don Quixote underscores how the protagonist's homosocial relationship with Sancho and the underlying humor of his idolization of Dulcinea place the protagonists outside of patriarchal social norms regarding male friendships and family constructs contemporary to the novel. As one would expect, women presented as the comedic impossible dream and the related concept of homoaffective male friendship are important leitmotifs uh, in Cervantes studies. That's right, okay. As Anthony J. Close points out, the protagonist's love for Dulcinea is comedic, a perspective in its direct opposition to the objective irony afforded by Frederick Schlegel's romantic aesthetics. Close maintains that, quote, Dulcinea is to Don Quixote what Oriana is to Amadis and Polinarda to Palmerin the goddess that dominates his thoughts and inspires his acts, end quote. Such a relationship maintains its nature as parody precisely because it negates Don Quixote from pursuing Dulcinea. Close explains, quote, Don Quixote's fidelity to his literary models, both in content and style, momentarily plunges the reader in a world of chivalric fantasy, end quote. Therefore, <coughs> Don Quixote and the reader are bound by chivalry and fantasy to remain within the realm of comedy. Such comedy and absurdity hinge on Don Quixote's madness, and therefore his status as a non-perfect body. It is therefore important to revisit McGrewer's perspective regarding non-able-bodiness as grouped with otherness. For example, one may conclude that when protagonists in early modern texts were able-bodied, another literary trope was utilized to justify male homoaffectivity. Friendship. Juan Pablo Gilos Ley reveals that at times relationships between noble men were triadic, with a woman form the, forming the pinnacle of the triangle of desire, as if on a pedestal. The two men, originally good friends, developed a profound, perfect male friendship that was that formulated the base of the triangle. So in other words, the two men were at the bottom, and then the, ma the female represented the pinnacle of the triangle. <coughs> explains that, was, that the Spanish model was actually based on the Bocaccian model, in which, quote, the plot moves two males in a safe relationship into a dangerous triangle by adding a woman to the equation. To a great extent, the challenges to perfect male friendship are presented as the result of the desire for the female character. Heterosexual love and duties disrupt the social script of masculine amicitia, end quote. Therefore, male-male friendships often went well beyond what we would today consider homosocial, homoaffective, or even homoerotic. Yet, Kilo Slay underscores that these triadic relationships were never consummated and always ended with tragedy, especially as can be observed in the friendship between protagonists Anselmo and Rotario in Cervantes' El Curioso Impertinente, which is a, uh, an intercalated brief novel in the first part of Don Quixote in the language. Quote, this novella is not a story about common sense and friendship. Rather, it is about male perfect friendship, a highly codified set of rules of male as well as female behavior, which underwent a transformation between the Middle Ages and modernity. End quote. Yet, Pilosle reveals how Cervantes creates a very different relationship between two men who abandoned the woman in order to preserve their friendship in an earlier work by Cervantes. La Galatea in 1585. Quote, Cervantes rendered his first imitatio of the classical topos. In that work, the author portrayed the connections between friendship, generosity, and desire through an idealized tale of Amicitia Perfecta, in which the two male friends chose to forego the fulfillment of their desire for the same woman in order to remain faithful to one another. End quote. Therefore, Cervantes first creates in La Galatea what today would be considered a perfect homoaffective relationship. 
precisely because the, two, the men focus on each other's relationship instead of following the Boccaccian model of amicitia perfecta later portrayed in El Curioso Impertinente, where perfectness underscores one friend's sacrifice so that the other may be happy. Yet for this triadic relationship to exist, the participants must be of the same social status. Therefore, the comedic nature of Don Quixote's investigation <coughs> with Dulce is augmented, first, when one considers the vertical relationship of patronage between Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, and because of which the socially accepted perfect friendship can never develop. Add to this Aldonza's even lower status as parody through her elevation to a lady of high social and moral status through Don Quixote's madness, and the humoristic nature is revealed when compared to the amicitia perfecta. Indeed, the whole notion of a perfect male friendship represents an elitist perspective as viewed in literature. The relationships can never be consummated precisely because if they were to be, they would evoke an additional criminal dynamic that Christian Berko identifies as a power struggle for dominance within early modern relationships involving male-male sodomy. Berko signals the value of analyzing trial records and historical sources that focus on adolescent boys who accuse older men of sodomy and violation, thereby documenting intergenerational homoerotic sexual relations that resulted in very polemic trials. The Amicitia therefore allowed the thematic narration of homoaffective love between men, but it can only exist because one of the men committed the ultimate sacrifice so that his friend could survive and be happy. In the end, the Amicitia Perfecta effectively prolongs perpetual homoaffectivity in the reader precisely because no same-sex relationship is ever consummated. And by the way, most of these ended tragically by all three of them dying, so that's one thing I had left out of this, but I thought would be worth clarifying. It's always tragic for everybody involved. Okay. From a lesbian perspective, Mary Gossi provides an exemplary feminist approximation to the novel of Don Quixote. Quote, Aldonza Lorenzo is butch. I realize that when I say this, I am writing both as a feminist theorist and as a Cervantist, and as both as a radical critic and a Hispanist. It is hard to play all of those roles at once, but not impossible." End quote. Gassi interprets Sancho Panza's description of Aldonza in chapter 25 of part one of the novel as indicative of a masculine butch dyke. In the following passage, Sancho describes Aldonza to Don Quixote. Quote, I know her very well, replied Sancho, and can testify that she can toss the bar as far as the brawniest lad in the whole town, and by Jove, she's a sensible girl, tall and straight, with hair on her chest, and capable of helping out of a jam any knight who's wandering about, or is about to wander, and who might choose her or his lady." End quote. Gassi therefore perceives the description of the binary butch Aldonza and feminine Dulcinea as representative of an example of non-traditional representations of women's bodies. Quote, in the relationship between Aldonza and Dulcinea, not as real women, but as gendered textual functions, butch femme works as a figure of writing and of representation that suggests the possibility of a narrative that does not consume women's bodies. End quote. Therefore, Gassi reveals not an essentialist feminist perspective that focuses on the gender binary of butch and femme, but rather highlights an early modern Spanish narrative representation of a female body that is not transgressed. Lisa Wallendorf offers insight as to the process of examining Don Quixote from a feminist perspective through the limited instances in which criticism focuses on women, uh, images of women in men's texts the roles of women within the text, and the roles of women as readers in modern times. Wallendorf underscores the goal of feminist theory when analyzing literature and other cultural production to utilize feminist historicism to approximate a rereading of Don Quixote that focuses on the relationship between the writer, text, and reader as contextualized by Spanish society contemporary to Cervantes. The focalization of women within men's texts is therefore key to Wallendorf's analyses. Querying the relationship between Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, Daniel Eisenberg indicates that, quote, a lifelong friendship seems possible in Cervantes' world only between men. 
there is in his works no exploration of meaningful male-female relationship, end quote. Eisenberg further comments how the combination of Don Quixote's age and lack of interest in marriage makes him queer. Quote, Don Quixote has much of the homosexual about him. He is near 50, but is still a virgin, perhaps impotent with women. He has never been married, nor does marriage or reproduction interest him. Don Quixote prefers the all-male world of his beloved chivalric books, in which the adult knight is served by a boy squire. End quote. Such a categorization, although on the verge of stereotypical, underscores how the protagonist's family construct falls outside of contemporary patriarchal social norms, as mentioned earlier. Further, it signals the essentialist, homosocial, all-male world dictated by chivalry. Queer theory, then, can be considered as a complementary to feminist analyses that focus on any aspect of literature or cultural production that normalizes patriarchal constructs or heterosexuality as fixed identities. While sexuality represents a major point of departure in queer studies, other representations or concepts that challenge the normalizing effectiveness of patriarchal society are also valuable. Homosociality and homoaffectivity, for example, are valuable thematic approximations to texts that do not necessarily focus on same-sex eroticism or explicit uh, concepts such as sodomy, or even explicit relationships between women that today would be called lesbianism. Therefore, when a protagonist routinely avoids such a family construct, it signals its analytical value within queer theory parameters that consider such uh, constructs as contrary to hegemonic, patriarchal, heterosexist, contemporary social norms. To conclude, I propose that the high visibility of homosexual otherness found in early Spanish societies, such as those within El Andalus, make it impossible to ignore the lacuna of explicit sexual otherness in Don Quixote. I also maintain that Dulcinea, as a figure of otherness, and whose insist in existence places her outside of heteronormalization, is, from the beginning, queer. Therefore, it is important to note the possibility of examining further narratives within the text, such as the adventure of Andres in part one, which offers an intriguing metaphors of sadism and masochism, for example, that are, I consider, necessary uh, future investigations in Cervantes scholarship. Eisenberg concludes that in order to analyze sexual concepts disguised as nebulous metaphors and illusions due to the persecution that they feared, one must, quote, search outside the text for keys to its interpretation, end quote, such as in queer theory. Finally, I conclude that some present-day academics resist queer theory because it focuses on the subjectivity of, uh, because queer theory focuses on the subjectivity of, of sexual identities and not on the fixed sexual identities maintained in heteronormative uh, terminology. Additionally, because the heterosexual paradigm is also limited to the same temporality as homosexuality, queer and feminist theories provide, provide perhaps two of the few sexually unbiased theoretical constructs that can analyze early modern sexualities and genders. In other words, the heterosexual model must also follow the temporal limitations set forth in the, in the 19th century. When contemplating both sides of this binary, heteronormative and homonormative analyses, the highest value afforded by queer readings is to cast aside all normalizing social constructs in order to properly analyze and contextualize early modern texts in a sexually objective manner. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. That was wonderful. We do have time for questions. I'm actually going to ask you the first one. Okay. Um,